Good evening and welcome to the regular meeting of the City of Glendale Commission on the Status of Women. Roll call please. Vice Chair Burns. Present. Commissioner Devine. Here. Commissioner Kojayan. Present. Ex officio Mirsahanian. Here. Ex officio Sahakian. Present. Commissioner Wiseman. Present. Chair Miller. Present. Thank, Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Hidalgo. Next item on the agenda, please. The agenda for the January 13, 2014 meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside of City Hall on or before January 10, 2014. Item number two, introductions and presentations. At A, human and civil rights, human trafficking, human rights, and our call to action. Anna Cho Fenley, project coordinator for the Anti-Recidivism Project. Thanks, Ms. Hidalgo. I'd like to do a brief introduction for Anna Cho Fenley. She's a program director at the Anti-Recidivism Co Coalition, a nonprofit organization working to better the lives of individuals and families affected by the justice system. Ms. Cho Fenley uses her past experience as a therapist, social worker, researcher, and policy advocate to develop and implement strength-based evidence-formed programs that reduce rates of recidivism and promote leadership. In addition to her work at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, Ms. Cho Finley works alongside the USC School of Social Work, her alma mater, and other local entities to develop victim-centered interventions, research evaluations, and proposals for the anti-human trafficking movement. She also participates in the local LA chapter of the Association of Filipinas Feminist Fighting Imperialism, Refutalization, and Marginalization, a trans um, national feminist organization focused on women and children of color issues. Anna Cho Finley is a social worker first and strives to help be the voice for those who are voiceless. Thanks for being here with us, Anna. It's a lot of long words. <laughs> I have to say recidivism every time I give out my email, so I understand. Um, thank you first and foremost for even having me here today. Um, I see very many familiar faces and just an honor to be in a room with so many um, strong, passionate female leaders in the community, so thank you. Um, tonight I'm here to discuss an incredibly important but heartbreaking reality of the destructive forces of human trafficking and modern day slavery. This is a global conf conflict, however, tonight um, I will be sharing more on the local level of current practices and uh, interventions that we could possibly be using here in Glendale. Um, I would like to begin by looking at the, just a quick overview of what human trafficking looks like across the board. Um, you will see both local and global statistics. Some points that I would like to point out is LA is one of the top three points of entry into this country for human trafficking. That is across the nation. Huge statistic to notice. Um, it is the second fastest growing criminal enterprise after drug trafficking something we'll talk about later, very connected, both of these. Um, 20.9 million and growing estimated number of human trafficking. I've seen closer into the lower 30 millions recently, um, so that statistic is ever growing and very difficult to find because of the underground nature of this industry. Um, over half of our forced labor victims would be women and girls, so this is a perfect discussion to be having in a group of like this where we're really looking at gender responsive interventions. Uh, again, 98% of sex trafficking, so we're, we said forced labor earlier, now we're talking about sex trafficking, which we'll get into the different definitions, but are, again, women and girls. Um, looking at the average age, 11 to 14 years old, that is also a statistic for the state of California. The actual definition of human trafficking, all acts involved in the recruitment, abduction, transportation, harboring, transfer, sale, or receipt of persons within national or across international borders through force, coercion, fraud, or deception. I'm going to stop there and kind of break this down a little bit. Um, the next slide. So when we're looking at what are these acts that involve recruitment, abduction, et cetera, some of these acts might look like bonded labor, Bonded labor and debt bondage would be maybe I was starting to work for someone and then they create these ridiculous debts for me. So stories that I've heard from young girls, for instance, are charging someone $20 for a bar of soap. Um, so she's constantly accruing debt and will basically never be able to get out of this life. Um, 
Labor trafficking, again, that's, that's kind of what we hear about um, with our more immigrant populations of being re recruited over the border and having to work in very unhealthy, unsafe situations. Um, involuntary servitude, involuntary domestic servitude. So these are kind of what it looks like more on the international level. Um, and then domestically within the U.S., we're seeing a lot of children for commercial sex. Um, we don't see as much of like child soldiers, for instance. Um, so we will look at deeper examples of what it looks like in the state of California, but this is kind of just the examples of what the acts of that definition look like. Um, moving on to, to understand just how this happens. Um, this, this is a chart that was, um, it stems from an article actually written by a pimp in prison. Um, you can look it up. I included the, the link on there. Um, but he actually wrote a really interesting and honest article about how he recruited girls. And it makes complete sense if you look at the, if you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So the, what this looks at is, okay, for instance, our first needs, physiological needs. We need food, we need shelter, we need those immediately, right? So what does that look like in recruitment? Maybe I meet a young girl in a park and she's hungry. Okay, would you like to go to McDonald's? I'll buy you a meal. That's an immediate need, right? Then we move up to safety and security. What is that like? Create an illusion of protection. Get her away from her family. You're then separating her from her resources, but then you're also kind of bringing her in, right? Then we move up. What is our next need in life? Love and belonging. This is where it gets really complicated, very destructive, um, using physical violence, using emotional violence. And again, back to that debt bondage example that I, that I gave you. At this level, the, the victim is becoming more deeply ingrained into a bad situation, right? Um, Moving up into self-esteem, how, how do we keep you? We, we lower your self-esteem on a daily basis. Um, this might also look, and this is where legislation gets complicated, sometimes we might recruit that young boy or a girl to be kind of the middle person, as in, I'm going to give you a role and make you feel like your self-esteem is boosted, but really, it's just another tactic for me to own you. Um, and then all the way to the top, how do we, reach, how do we all reach self actualization, sorry. Um, this is where you probably have reached a level so much that you are actually taking on a role um, in the industry. And so that's kind of the steps about a, a really just surface level example of what a pimp might be doing to kind of recruit young boys or girls. But I just thought this was a really interesting uh, breakdown because it was also from the, you know, the mind and words of a pimp himself. Um, these are all articles, which I hope you guys can look at these later on, because these were all local. Glendale, Burbank, things happening around here. You'll see you know, a girl as young as 16 who was living with a 70-year-old. Um, Inland Empire, not, not necessarily Glendale, but very our neighbors nearby. Um, huge sex trafficking ring was arrested there. The Inland Empire is actually an area of focus. There's quite a few task forces and really amazing work going out there. So. Uh, maybe that could be an idea that we talk about later is uh, partnering with kind of our neighbor counties and cities. And then into human trafficking in the state of California, some statistics I want to point out is that 72% of the victims that were, um, well, I guess identified, so that's probably way more than we even know about, but this was done by the Attorney General's office, so this was around 1,277 victims were interviewed, and out of that number, 72% were U.S. born. So that really is a strong statistic to tell you that this is happening domestically. This is not, an, it just, this isn't just um, a border or immigrant issue. This is, this is really happening to our children. Um, and then the connection to, to foster care, I really like to point out, um, specifically to Los Angeles County and also to the state of California, Karen Bass, the Attorney General, there, there's a couple of entities that are really looking at this uh, issue. And over 50%, and I, as someone who is working in the juvenile justice system right now, I would say that it's a disturbing number of how many girls are in our juvenile <coughs> halls and are there because of CSEC, which stands for Commercially Sexually Exploited 
Um, and I'm going to get to that on the next slide. But this is just, an, uh, I want to bring this up because as we're thinking of in interventions and action steps forward, we need to be looking at all these other systems that we can be collaborating with and realizing that these young girls and boys have, most of the time from these statistics we can tell, have entered into these other systems before they're getting into juvenile hall or into getting arrested, basically, for being victims. Um, some other statistics about Alameda County, 2011, you know, again, almost half of the kids were foster care kids. Um, again, human trafficking in California. Um, so top destination states, again, California is on the top of the list. Los Angeles is one of the top three points of entry. Um, they are estimating because we have such a, we, I mean, in terms of proximity to borders, we have, it is a little bit easier access, but because of that, there's probably way more underground statistics that we will never even be able to know. If you look at things like in LA, like the fashion districts, our agricultural economy, you know, things, jobs where we're easily um, hiding this industry, massage parlors, uh, storefront, nail salons, um, just any of these kind of Easily hidden type of businesses, it's definitely happening in, in L.A. Uh, the triangle you might hear quite often, that would consist of Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and our lovely capital, Sacramento. So another interesting statistic. Sacramento is the top five cities for child trafficking specifically. Why? I don't know. There's a couple theories out there. Um, it's a little disturbing, though, right? Um, I would say the whole West Coast, just because it is the West Coast, we're very easily able to, to transport things like drugs and humans. Um, I went to the Attorney General's conference, I think, last year, and she showed a very disturbing um, image of these tunnels that are in between Mexico and the U.S., and these tunnels are so well organized that they actually have lighting systems through these tunnels to lead people to be able to bring children across the border. So that to me and probably many of you here is a blatant just slap in the face that we are not doing anything. Um, or I shouldn't say anything, not doing enough, right? Um, so state of California, we are on the map for the entire country. Um, and then I wanted to bring up the definitions of commercially sexually exploited child, CSEC. Um, many of you might have heard this term, but there is a, there is a difference um, between CSEC and then human trafficking, and I kind of want to break this down. Sexually exploited children will exchange sex to have their needs met, so it could be just like for food or shelter. You, um, in most young people, this might look like survival sex, if you've heard of that. So, uh, um, again, foster care, uh, homeless youth are the most vulnerable for this type of exploitation. And then human trafficking would be the definition of if there is a third party involved, so like a pimp, or someone who's actually exchanging money for the sale of your body. Is that confusing? So you technically could be CSEC and trafficking, but it's something to think about in terms of when we're thinking about policy and how we are kind of, do these labels um, help increase victim-centered policies or are they kind of getting more kids in trouble? So something to think about. Um, and then I just have a piece about uh, knowing the signs. This was all taken from very well-known organizations, the Polaris Project, great resource if you ever want to do research, and also the National Human Trafficking Resource Center. Um, so physical indicators, I mean, excessive work-related industry, injuries, bruises, um, you know, just all, the, all these things that might kind of trigger, trigger something in your mind, right? Um, you, we obviously don't want to be thinking everyone is a traffic victim, <laughs> so I, I definitely encourage you to, to refer to your resources and refer to these, these hotlines that are out there. No question is a dumb question. You can pick up the phone anytime and just ask them, like, I think... This person might be in danger, but I'm not really sure, and they're amazing. You can call them any time of day. And you can actually, this is another thing, if you go to the Polaris Project, their website, it's really interesting because you can, you can break it down to the local level. You can see Glendale and see how many calls were made to this hotline from Glendale. And you can see what kind of calls that were made. 
was this a case of like maybe sexual or labor or you know they break it up so you guys can actually have current reports about who who or how many people are making calls for your local city um, other important signs you guys can again can look at this later but uh, I just thought this was a really good list of kind of things to things to think about um, might be on your radar and then I really want, I know I kind of flew through this, but I really wanted this uh, discussion to be action-oriented because I've gone to so many conferences, I'm sure you guys have too. Like, what are we going to do now, right? Uh, sla this country was founded on slavery. Uh, so it's been going on for a while, right? And I think it's time that it's not just about maintaining an issue, but it's about ending it right now. It needed to be ended yesterday, right? So the biggest thing is educating yourself, organizing, but not necessarily do we need to be creating all these other movements. Really identify the movements that are happening right now and how can we support and engage with those movements and make sure that we're all working together. Support legislation, lobby, volunteer, fundraise, attend local events. On the very last page, I have a website link on there. Um, Charity Globe, I want to say it's called, but they have an amazing list of every single Southern California event going on for this whole Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, and then if you guys have an event, that would be an amazing place for you to put your events on too, right? Um, research and evaluation. I'm currently working with some professors and local leaders within USC. Uh, we have done a couple evaluations and are continuously looking for research. There is not enough research out there. Um, a lot of these shelters and organizations and what we've found so far focus on domestic violence, focus on complex trauma, which all are included in this topic, but there's not necessarily human trafficking specific interventions or research out there. So that's something that we have to keep pushing. Um, this idea of freedom bags, I think this is a great idea that you could do on the local level of just fundraising and gathering donations. Freedom bags are, I mean, think about it. If, you're just, if you just got rescued, you have nothing. Um, you probably... I mean, I've heard cases of, of people going in the bathroom and just like trying to make a call very quickly just so they can get out because they had two seconds to call, make a phone call, right? Um, so you got rescued, you have nothing with you. Uh, a freedom bag would be, it can include you know, a pair of clothes, gift cards, I mean, anything you guys can really think of. What would you want as a female, as a child, as a young boy, as someone who's scared and has nobody, what would you want um, in that kind of first point of contact bag. Um, and then this is a quote uh, that I will forever remember heard from a, a very uh, well-known speaker. And she always says, empower victims, champion survivors. And that is a quote that I think that will always stick with me and, and kind of empower me to know what we are really doing here. And it's, it really isn't about experience exploiting the exploited, if that makes any sense. You know, we have to use people as, as partners and resources and look at them as the experts and not uh, override the movement with our own agendas. So that's why I, I always try to remind myself of that quote. Um, I brought up this example. This was, I don't know if you guys have seen this. This was done, I want to say just a few months ago, like this last fall. Um, this is an article about a sting operation using a virtual Filipina girl. Um, and they posted this girl, she's not real. Um, and they caught so many sex predators just by posting this fake girl on the website. So this indicates a couple things. <laughs> One, <laughs> we're not regulating the internet at all to be able to so easily <coughs> catch people with just by simply posting a fake girl on there. That's one issue. And secondly, I think this also shows you, again, fitting for this conversation, the status on young girls, and especially young girls of color. This girl clearly looks like she's about 10 to 12 years old. She's not a teenage girl by any means. She is a little girl, right? So I think that we also have to be taking that into consideration of age, demographics, most vulnerable populations, most vulnerable communities, um, and really being on, having an honest, candid discussion about what, who, who, what the faces of human trafficking looks like. Um, so that was an interesting intervention, really recent. And then I also wanted to talk to Glendale about social impact bonds. This is um, 
it's a little bit controversial. There's there are pros and cons to everything, right? But I think this is a really interesting, innovative approach because it really redirects your funds from, it basically gives the state less risk. So the state never wants to invest in things that don't have outcomes and tangible data, right? So this is a way, social impact, you're obviously looking at how does this actually socially impact my community. So it allows the state to borrow large sums of money and basically say, if this works, we're going to invest in you and give it back, right? But it's also incentivizing involvement from, from whether it's private donations or other organizations that maybe you wouldn't necessarily work with, like real estate companies or other investors that aren't necessarily connected to state government or grants. Um, and then really looking at interventions that you can prove this is going to impact my community, right? And then this really falls into something that's happening in Glendale. Glendale is, and maybe you guys can share this more with me, Glendale is doing this initiative looking at social media connected to bullying. Yeah, you guys, you're all shaking your heads. But, you know, given the research of what we know with human tra trafficking and using things like technology and how we can make that connection between maybe regulating the internet or flipping this whole message. How can we use technology and the internet as a way to campaign and create awareness? Um, something really interesting I saw Ashton Kutcher is doing. Um, he's the, the famous actor. Um, he was speaking at um, an event a while ago, but he's being very aggressive. Um, he's, uh, they've, they're creating these websites, and they're basically child pornography websites. And when you click on the site to try and, and view something, a, a different website comes up and says, boom, and it, a pin drops on the map on, directly on your house, and it says, we know exactly where you are, basically. <laughs> Very aggressive approach, not necessarily something I completely agree in, but I love the idea of, like, yeah, let's end it now. Let's call these people out. Um, federal legislation has not found a way to regulate the Internet, and... I think it's great that you guys on the local level are realizing and looking at social media and how we can educate our children and how we can do a little bit of prevention work. So this was an idea I was thinking of just on your local level, something we could maybe bridge together. Um, and if you are interested, please contact me and I'll get USCN on it and we'll <laughs> hopefully create some proposals. And then lastly, I just gave you a list of resources of some of like my go-to places and the hotlines again you can call them for anything and they will someone will sit down and talk to you and they're amazing and do you guys have any questions for me I'm sorry that was a lot <laughs> thank you Anna it's always great when you come before us and our viewing public with the wealth of information do we have any questions or comments from the dais me Student ex officio? Yes. You spoke about the effect it has on girls and women. Mm. Could you give me any statistics that it has on boys and men? Any statistics on the top? Wait, it affects you. Mean, are you talking about like psychological effect? What are we talking oh, about here? Or the recruitment of them, to be more specific. Right. I think with young men, uh, the other issue that I didn't talk about is this is very highly related to gangs. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, the, the organized crime is definitely... Um, kind of the leader of this. Um, so I think that when we're looking at this issue, oftentimes it is maybe a pimp who is taking control. However, when we're talking about different kinds of trafficking, I can say if you're looking at like labor trafficking, those statistics will look a little bit different, right? Yes. Um, and for young boys in particular, well, and young girls too, but for young boys in particular, the LGBTQ community would probably be one of the most vulnerable populations and then back to kind of like using that as survival sex. So that's why I say we do have to look at the intersections of all these different populations. So the LGBTQ community is very highly vulnerable, then they might be moving, that's a very high risk population for homelessness and how is that connected to being ex exploitation and you know all these other issues. Like if you really look into it, it's all, we're all connected. So I really believe that we do need to be looking at all the separate movements not as separate movements, but a human movement, right? Thanks so much. Thank you. Commissioner Devine? Um, just recently, last week I think it was, in mm -hmm. the LA Times, two articles caught my eye. One was 
a, um, an arrest, a trafficking ring that was broken up, and they had 36 kids, mm -hmm. children. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were shipping them to Las Vegas, I believe it was. And there were some boys <coughs> involved. And, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So that happened just recently. Mm -hmm. Also in the newspaper, um, Oakland, California, I guess is a hub for this crime. <coughs> And they have um, come out with a huge education awareness effort where they're doing billboards all over the, the city. Mm -hmm. uh, they're putting out educational information, flyers, et cetera, all over the, uh, the city um, because they want to try to stop uh, this crime. It's my belief that um, we have to look at the young children that are being affected by this. Now, the commission worked with the Safe Family Task Force on getting a curriculum in our schools for safe dating. I think this would be a fabulous way, a tool, to get this message to the young children because they are the ones that really need it. They need to know that if they're in a park all by themselves, looking lonely, that some good looking <clears throat> good-looking fella might come up to them and say, hey, you know, you're really gorgeous. Let's go and have, you know, a Coke or something. And before they know it, they're in big trouble. So I'd like to see um, this commission uh, somehow get involved. Well, not somehow. We are involved with the Safe Family Task Force, last I heard. Um, and, and see if there is a way that we can get this kind of a curriculum into the Glendale schools. And if we can't do that, if it doesn't go that far, then perhaps we can do some sort of a, uh, a, a girls' conference, a summit, Love it. whereby we can educate, show them all of these facts, figures, um, signs, mm -hmm. and, uh, and educate our middle school girls, our high school girls, so that they know all of this, because most of them are just totally unaware. And, you know, they see somebody that looks really sad, and they, you know, they just kind of walk on by. And it's that, that trafficker that's going to see that and just pounce right on them. Right, so right. I think th those are ways that, uh, that this commission can, can get involved. Yeah. So then I can share a little bit of my work with, with a firm. That's the Transnational Feminist Organization. We actually have been going into middle schools and high schools um, and talking to the young girls kind of about not necessarily focusing just on human trafficking, but more f empowerment um, in a kind of a backwards way and just kind of what are your options for life? What does it mean to be a, a young girl in this world? Um, and it's really interesting because they actually do know a lot about trafficking. Um, because they're more aware of this issue in their neighborhoods than some of us are. It's really, really interesting to hear their stories. And I did meet this girl the other day who, um, you know, how are you? What, what do you? what do you like doing? And she said, oh, I'm learning karate. I said, oh, that's, that's amazing. I, you know, why did you start doing that? And she said, because I want to take out everyone who does human trafficking. This girl was 11. <laughs> and, I was, and I just said, yeah, you go for it. And you teach all your friends karate, too. Um, I have a comment. Um, so, Anna, mm -hmm. one of the um, things that you brought up were about the local articles. If you could just identify, what did you link or search for so that if people wanted to go back specifically to see those articles, where might they, what words did you use? Uh huh. Um, well, I am kind of an academic nerd, so uh, I, I do a lot of research. But, you know, you always put in the quotes and, you, you know, you can look regionally and just say human trafficking statistics and then say Glendale, or you can say Southern California, you can say Los Angeles. Um, a lot of this information I tend to look at, uh, you know, like the Attorney General websites, or look at the big entities who are really collecting data. But because this is such an underground industry, you know, I'm always skeptical of the data, and that's something that I would want to share with, with everyone when you are finding data. It's, it's even more disturbing knowing that probably most of this is not getting reported, right? Um, so, yeah. Well, and I also heard you say on the local, so we could put Glendale, we could put Burbank, and then we could also put in relation to the Inland Empire, and that would really... The Inland Empire has a lot going on. Uh, Orange County has a lot going on in terms of task forces, movements, a lot of local convening and organizing. Um, L.A. County and Orange County are very separate for some reason. Uh, don't know why. Um, 
But yeah, those are the kind of the areas that I've heard of really, uh, really big kind of organized movements happening. But again, any of these websites, you're going to kind of be seeing the same information. Mm -hmm. You're going to be going around in circles. So um, just because I refer I, to that list is probably the best starting point. Okay. Well, I do know on our local level, and I know that some of our commissioners um, are part of Seroptimus. I know that this is something that's mm -hmm. very near and dear to them, an issue that yeah, they take up. So, so perhaps with with your involvement, there might be something collaboratively that yeah. we could all look at so that of we're course. pooling all of our resources together instead yeah. of just one commission versus one organization versus what have you. Yeah, and I really like the idea of of making sure that we all do come from different backgrounds. Like I think often we get stuck in these silos of maybe we only look at service providers, but why aren't we looking at corporations and real estate companies and academia and the universities and the police department and even just local local leaders, you know. Um, I don't think we we have to just focus on people who are experts in the trafficking field because the point is to spread awareness, right? And to work on this this whole community movement. So I would love to work with you and bring in as many different <coughs> kinds of entities as possible and identify what we all bring to the table and and not really cross over and reinvent the wheel that's you know been going around since beginning of time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Any other questions? Discussion? Yes. I would like to say thank you for this informative information. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Anna, we very much appreciate having you here. As we stated, it's always a wealth of knowledge when you come before us. Thank you for your time. Yeah, and to be continued, I hope. Yeah, we hope so too. And we. I have uh, um, some ideas for the timing right. on it for our discussion that I'll speak that about with Ms. Alexani. Okay. Thank you. Just to clarify, Chair Miller, is it okay if we share your PowerPoint with the commission or? Oh, absolutely. Okay. We'll go ahead and email you the file. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item three, oral comment. Discussion is limited to items not a part of this agenda. Each speaker is allowed five minutes. The Commission may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or discussion. Staff may refer the matter to the proper department for investigation and report. Okay, and I have, for oral comments, I have one speaker card, and that would be Ms. Carmen Liberidian for the Armenian Relief Society. Welcome. Good evening, and thank you, Commission, for having me here and letting me connect with the community. Um, once again this year, we're having our third annual Winter Wonderland Festival. We've done this now three years, and we bring snow to Glendale, rides and everything else, but the snow is really what attracts most of the kids and their parents, because most of the kids haven't seen snow. Um, we have a 30-second uh, DVD here to, to play, but I just wanted to say that we're going to have the, uh, the usual great food, and the rides, and this year we're going to have a contest um, fashion show, and beauty contest and a uh, let's see and talent show. Okay, so besides that, we have also admission for ten and under will be free this year because we want to attract more children so that they can have the opportunity to see <clears throat> snow. I have a question. What what's the charge for ten and over? Oh, ten and over <laughs> is three dollars for one day, or you can buy a two day pass for five dollars. <laughs> Lemon and over. <laughs> Just. Come and enjoy the ARS Winter Wonderlands two-day festival taking place February 1st and 2nd on the grounds of St. Mary's Church located at 500... Central Avenue in Glendale. A chance to play with real snow, rides, games, and talent shows. Apply at arswestusa.org or call 818-500-1343. Great food and entertainment. Admission is $3 and it's free for ages 10 and under. Come and have a great time. See you there. We'll get rid of the glitches. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Uh, oh, okay, and... Um, well, I'll have a good time, so we'd like to invite you, and I thank you for the opportunity again for to come. Commissioner Kajoyan, would like. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, Mr. Libaritian, we call her Ingeruhi, Carmen, she's the vice chair of Armenian Relief Society Regional, 
and she's the executive, and she is also. I'm the chair on this. Commissioner Kojayan is the chair of this Winter Wonderland this year. And uh, as you know, the ARS members, all we do is the volunteer work to do to community. I guess she done a great job. And all day she is from one commission to another announcing great job. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you. Um, is there any way that students can volunteer to help at the event? Yes. Uh -huh. And then would they sign up um, through the organization, through the number that yes, was in the video? Call, yeah, call the number 818-500-1343. Um, no, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Next item is item four, consent items at A, approval of the minutes of the special commission meeting held on December 9, 2013. Are there any changes that the Commission would like to see made to the minutes, or do we have a motion to pass the minutes as presented? Do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion to pass the To pass the minutes as presented, to yes. approve them? And yes. do we have a second? Second. And if we could take a roll call. Vice Chair Burns? Yes. Commissioners Devine? Yes. Kojayan? Yes. Wiseman? Yes. Chair Miller? Yes. Thank you. Next item on the agenda, please. Item 5, action items at A, consideration and discussion of activities in March 2014 for Women's History Month. One, motion providing direction regarding co-sponsorship of the film screening of misrepresentation. Two, motion providing direction regarding activities in March 2014 for Women's History Month. Now I do have one speaker card for item 5A1, so after we give that report, if we could just be mindful and we'll bring that speaker up. Thanks, Chair Miller. Um, just to provide a brief report, the month of March is Women's History Month, um, and it has been in the, the U.S. since 1987. Uh, Women's History Month is an annual declared month that highlights the contribution of women to events in history and contemporary society. International Women's Day is also celebrated in March, and that's on March 8th. As part of the Women's History Month, the Associates of the Brand Library and Art Center are organizing a film screening called uh, or of misrepresentation, followed by a moderated discussion sometime in March. and. Um, at the time of this report, I don't, we didn't have a confirmed date, but I know Terry Deaver is here with us. I'm not sure if we have a confirmed date as of today. Um, the location most probably will be the central library for the, the screening and, and the discussion. The planning committee is also um, still working on securing a speaker for the moderated discussion after the film. The Associates of the Brand Library and Art Center are an independent nonprofit organization with a mission to provide support for the Brand Library and Art Center and to promote arts and education and cultural events, just as a background as to who the Associates of the Brand Library are. But just to provide a little bit of information about misrepresentation, it's an 87-minute film and it's rated TV 14. And it exposes how mainstream media contributes to the underrepresentation of women in positions of power and influence in America. It challenges the media's lim limited and often disparaging portrayals of women and girls, which make it difficult for women to achieve leadership positions and for the average woman to feel powerful herself. The film includes stories from teenage girls and provocative interviews with politicians, journalists, entertainers, activists, and um, academics. The um, the co-sponsorship, uh, the, the Associates of Brand Library are looking for a co-sponsorship from the Commission, and the co-sponsorship would include promoting the event in the community, a $100 sponsorship to help pay for the uh, portion of the cost of the licensing for the film, and the total cost is um, $295 plus tax and shipping, and to identify um, volunteers on the planning committee to help with planning the event and they're looking for um, up to two volunteers and I know our chair has been um, a little involved with uh, the planning so um, she would be one of the the people if commission um, would be okay and then we would like one more volunteer to help out 
the benefits of the co-sponsorship, the commission would get recognition on the day of the event, and of course the commission name and logo would go on any flyers and, and advertisements that go out into the community. Um, as I mentioned uh, before, the date and the time have not been determined, but most probably it will be at the Central Library, and the associates of the Brand Library are working with the Library Arts and Culture Department who will purchase the, the filming rights, and there's also an educational curriculum that can be purchased with the licensing of the film, which the library can use later on um, to, again, screen the film and to uh, include an educational component if uh, schools want to go out with their students. So the licensing fee would include um, uh, unlimited screening of the film at that, at that specific location. Staff is looking for commission direction on the sponsorship, on the co-sponsorship, and also if there are any um, ideas from the commission on other um, events for uh, March, for it being Women's History Month. And historically, staff was not able to find any specific event that was held in March specific to Women's History Month, but if commission has any ideas for um, this year or future years, staff is also looking for a motion for any recommendations. Like I said, we have Terry Deaver here from the Associates if the uh, Commission has any specific questions. Terry, could you come on up? May we Terry is here today representing, of course, she's here representing the Brand Associates, but please know that Terry is our chair of our Arts and Cultural Commission. So we have. And was there a question? Will there be an entrance fee in order to see the film? No, the program would be free. Um, I, I should mention that the associates started the, film, the real art film series last year. We did films like Women Art Revolution or War, which looked at the women's fe feminist movement in art back in the 1970s. We've done things that are a little bit more mainstream. We saw awful, we've had partnerships like with Los Angeles Film Forum, uh, which was more related specifically to art and, and experimental filmmaking. So we've this past year we've done about five different films where we've pulled together either partners or done it on our own, provided the screenings free to the public and brought in a speaker to help engage the audience afterward on the topic um, or their own experiences within the topic of the film. And this was something that we've been thinking about for a while, it's probably about a year, and we really felt that this film, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to, to see it or not, but that it really has a message that we want to make sure gets out to the entire Glendale community, if not broader than that, which is why we didn't want to just take this on on our own and, and present it and, and, and see who showed up. We really want to be able to talk to the Glendale Community College, to the schools, to you all, to your constituents as well, and, and of all ages, to bring people in and to make them really aware of the impact of the media on how women's future and power within uh, within our United States in particular, but in the world. Um, yeah, lost my train of thought. Do we have any other questions for Terry? Commissioner Devine? Um, Terry, are you looking at a certain day because it's a long film, so are you looking at like a Saturday when people have more time? We're not. Actually, we're looking at a Wednesday or Tuesday evenings. We've been doing the films on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays in, in general, thinking that it's more people have more opportunity during the week to go to something. They don't have their own private events that they're going to. Right now we're looking at the, the 5th, the 18th, or the 25th. Those are dates that we're floating by some people we've been talking to about possibly being presenters. Uh, I know the other thought I wanted to mention is that we talk about media, if, if you're curious about why the Brand Associates is interested in this, we are talking about films and television and newsprint and just the, the commercials and ad industries. So there's a lot of overlap between the arts and, and people who are directing films and writing films and, and being able to reach levels of influence in those industries as well. So my understanding of what we've been presented here with today as well as speaking to you is that our involvement would be, um, essentially it looks like it would be the brand associates and we would collaborate with you, we as the commission on the status of women. For $100, that would give us a co-sponsorship of this event. And it would take place as a screening during Women's History Month, followed by some sort of panel discussion on women in media. Um, 
It will either be a panel discussion or a single speaker, per which speaker. is right, right. what we've done before. We've been talking to, just to give you an example of people that we're reaching out to, we're reaching out to people who either have been involved in the industry itself and have felt the effects of that and maybe speak on the topic. We have, we've been in conversation with a woman who is featured in the film as an expert and also happens to work locally, and she's expressed interest if we can make the scheduling work. Oh, and also political leaders who have uh, experience in this area as well. So those are the, the people we're reaching out to right now, but we haven't had a confirmation on that. Have you screened, um, what's the length and time of other movies you've screened? They've been about an hour and a half each. So if we start at 7 o'clock, which is what we typically have done, assuming there's some introductory, a little starting a little bit late, if you start at 7.10 or so, that leaves you at about 8.40 for the completion of the film, which gives us about 20 to 30 minutes to have an engaged conversation, which is one of the reasons we stayed away from a full panel discussion and looked more at having somebody who's an expert in the air, in the field or can engage the audience in some way, and in particular with this, to give, leave them with some next steps. I think your previous speaker, for instance, was talking about what can you do, and that's one of the important things about this film as well, is what can you do, and that's one of the things that we really want to focus on at the, the, the completion of the film. Are there any other comments? May I commend you for your choice in the film and the, the ability to like uh, knowledge the, the students and girls because they do pay attention a lot to media uh, more than they read articles or they listen to panels. Um, I have seen the film and it does cover a lot of subjects all the way from reconstructive surgery uh, below the pelvic area and uh, to outfits that they ridicule for Condoleezza Rice it's it's an extremely informative and it makes you really angry but really empowered at the same time and it gives you a lot of um, drive to go forward and help your community of girls and women. And I'll add, it, it's not limited just to women. They do touch on how it affects young boys and men yes. and the portrayal and their expectations based on what the media, uh, for there be, to be powerful, to be in control, whereas women are more objectified and, and looking at their, their sexuality as a way towards power and it's helping to, to, to pe people thinking differently about that. I came away from the film the same way, realizing that if I'm watching somebody who I might respect quite highly, that I still have this internal dialogue that happens, oh, look what she's wearing, is that right? Oh, that makeup. And I realized that I really, that is the first thing I do, and I may not do that with a male counterpart. So it becomes, I think it's, it's quite eye-opening. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, so we are looking for um, a motion providing redirection on co-sponsoring of the film. Do we have a motion? I so move. We have a motion. Do we I'll have a second? second? Yes. Okay. Sorry, Chair Miller, can we also identify the volunteers if there is another person, including yourself, that would like to as part of the motion? Sure. Unless we're just going with one volunteer. So I just want to make sure it's part of the motion. Sure. Any uh, if student of ex, ex officio members are allowed to volunteer, may I yes. volunteer myself <laughs> <laughs> under your uh, approval? Well, it would be it would be anticipated. Thank you, um, student ex officio. It would be anticipated and hoped for that the students could. We, that would be in addition and beyond to commissioners. So you would Thank be you. welcome. I'd like to volunteer. Okay, so the motion would include um, Commissioner Kajayan. So I so move that we um, sponsor or um, afford $100 for the uh, showing of uh, this representation. And uh, uh, Commissioner Kajayan and Commissioner Miller will be our representatives. I, I just wanted to know if there was any other commissioner. I've been fairly involved in this process. Is there any other commissioner that really wanted to be involved in the planning committee or is the commission okay with me continue, continuing on as part of the process? It doesn't sound like someone's so, no one's so moved, then I'll be happy to continue. So it would be. You need a second to the motion. Second. Uh, no, I already seconded it. She seconded. <laughs> she had already seconded. Yeah. So now um, it looks like we're unanimous. And so we're going to go forward. Unless you'd like me to take roll call, it looks pretty clear we're unanimous. Okay. 
Um, with that said, thank you. Looks like we are very hopeful and excited to hear about this date. Thank you for presenting this opportunity to the commission, and uh, we look forward to going forward. Now, um, if we can, as we go on to the next item on the agenda, I'm wondering if we could move item 6A up. We have one other speaker here. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going to hold off. Let's talk about um, any other activities in 2014, but let's completely close this whole item before we bring up our next speaker. Are there any other um, direction, discussion, activities in 2014 that this commission would like us to consider and for staff to look into? Okay, so it looks like for this year, 2014, we have our activity for Women's History Month. And with that said, um, I don't, with that said, we're going to move on to the next item. So if we could move item 6A up for reports only, that would be Girls on the Run. I have a card here for Elizabeth Sadlin. Thank you, Ms. Hidalgo. Sure. Um, at 6A, under reports for information only, it's an update regarding fall 2013 season of Girls on the Run in South Glendale. <coughs> Are you, would you like to present the report, please? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Alexanian. Thank you, Chair Miller. Girls on the Run is a fitness and empowerment program for girls third to eighth grade, and this commission has supported um, Girls on the Run since 2010 um, with the sponsorship. Uh, the locations that Girls on the Run has, um, uh, in Glendale, that Girls on the Run has had uh, teens for the um, Girls on the Run program has been uh, 2008. It was in Verdugo Woodlands Elementary School. 2000 um, in 2009, it was Artie White and Lincoln Elementary Schools. 2010 was Edison Elementary School. 2011 was Cerritos Elementary School, and 2013 they added a team at Roosevelt Middle School. Uh, just we have Elizabeth Sadlin here from Girls on the Run who has a, a PowerPoint providing the commission with an update on how the funds have been used and how many girls have uh, benefited from the sponsorship that the commission has uh, provided for the, the program. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the invitation and thank you. I'm here just to say thank you tonight and give you a chance to see some of the um, powerful impact that you've had through the sponsorship that you provided to support a team of Girls on the Run at Edison Elementary in our fall season. So um, you, as you just heard, Girls on the Run is a program over 12 weeks where the girls in teams get together with volunteer coaches twice a week after school and through a series of activities discover how to take take good care of themselves, be good friends, and make a difference in the community. And your sponsorship to help make that possible for girls at Edison Elementary this fall season, um, as your sponsorships have over multiple seasons over these years. Uh, girls on the Run believes in powerful girls. And when we think about what is important for making a lasting difference in our community, these girls are what's going to make it happen. And so we give them an opportunity to come together with caring adults and peers as friends to be able to discover the power that they have inside themselves and to make a difference in the community using their voice in ways that matter to them. In Glendale for fall of 2013, these are our, some of our girls from Edison Elementary. There were 74 girls in the program in Glendale at our four sites, our four fall sites. 70% of the girls who participated at Edison did receive financial assistance. Uh, we are committed countywide to making sure that the program reaches girls, regardless of their financial ability for their family to be able to pay the program fee. And so we wanted to make sure that by partnering with organizations like yours, individual donors and foundations, we're able to assure that across the county. The power of the program is really built on these mentor relationships of volunteer adults who care about the girls, show up for all these practices, and um, consistently come to, to be at their side in this learning. And this um, head coach from Edison was just hired as one of our staff members. So we're very excited to be bringing one of our Glendale own now <laughs> onto the staff. 
I used to work with her. Did you work She's with fantastic. Yeah. Oh, we were really excited to be In able fact, to have she her was on. actually assigned to the department I worked at, so oh, I worked wow. closely. She's excellent. She's great. Another connection. Mm -hmm. um, you see that the girls are building friendships and being able to have groups of friends who have this common language around how to have positive communication with each other, address issues of bullying and gossip, to be able to think together about how to address challenges that come up in their lives, and to be able to meet girls across age groups. We often find girls and their parents say, it's great to be able to meet someone outside of my classroom, outside my grade level. And you can tell they have a lot of fun together. Um, very important to the program is community service. The girls making a difference in a way that they choose in the community. And for this fall season, our Edison girls decided to hold a bake sale to be able to benefit the, the victims of the um, hurricane in the Philippines. And so they sent their donations and received back a letter that thanked the girls and called the girls our heroes. And that just really struck me. How often can you be helping Helping girls who are, you know, out there being third, sixth graders, and really they become heroes to somebody somewhere all the way around the world. And I think that's the kind of change that really gives them the power and the memory to know that they can make a difference and go forward and do that through time. Of course, our 5K is the culminating event. The girls have been having so much fun walking and running and doing activities um, at the um, practices over the 12 week season. They come together for a non competitive 5K walk run. And so we had the pleasure of welcoming a couple of the commissioners there at our 5K at Universal Studios on December 8th. And here's some of the, the girls smiling. It was a cold morning, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so I'd welcome either of you to share any of your experiences is there at the finish line, Commissioner Weissman, Commissioner Sakanyan. It was an amazing event to actually be at and to see the girls running across that finish line, so excited that they made it to the end. And it was just great to actually give the awards to them, I, well, the medallions, and to put them around their necks. And they said, wow, another one? Wow, we get another one? Well, of course, because they do such great things, and they're such um, nice and respectful children, and they learn so much from each other and from the events. So thank you for having this in our city. And it's, for joining it's us. great. Thank yes. you. Yes, I really, really enjoyed uh, seeing all the girls and, and their coaches. My only problem is I, I, the coaches, some look so young to me, I wanted to give them a medal too. <laughs> That's always the trick, figuring out which are the girls and which are the coaches and the volunteers and the sisters and the nieces and the friends who are running exactly. along. It's, it's kind of tricky. And then you get the other people who are not girls on the run participants, but they want that medal too. And we say, no, this is a, an accomplishment that mm -hmm. the girls have dedicated the 12 weeks to doing this. So at the end, the week after that event, they hold a closing ceremony and um, celebrate their accomplishments and each girl is celebrated with a recognition of something powerful about her that's unique about her and that's another way that we close out the season. Um, there was one girl who midway through her mom told me she said I can't do this. This is a very hilly course. It's a long way 3.2 miles and at the end as she finished the cr finish line crossed that finish line where you were she said I can't wait to do this again. So that's the kind of accomplishment that girls carry forward with them in other areas of their lives. Um, so we know that there's lots of ways that anybody can be part of supporting the life of a girl through Girls on the Run. We um, recognize and, and welcome people who want to be volunteer coaches who have the ability to commit to once or twice a week for the 12 weeks, um, to be donors, to be volunteers at the um, 5K event, other one-time events, um, or to participate in your own physical activity event and be able to raise funds is something we call a soulmate. There's lots of information about this on our website. Um, and our spring season is starting up in February. So if you are interested in being face-to-face, in-person, part of the action, you see that our Glendale sites at Cerritos, Edison, Lincoln, Roosevelt, and Verdugo Woodlands are ramping up for this spring season, which will run from February to May. Our 5K will be May 18th, so we hope that you'll put that on your calendars and we'll get to see more or all of you there. And um, for those who, who are listening, who are not necessarily directly in Glendale, we have sites all over LA County. Um, so we would welcome anybody to check on the website, be in touch with me or with any of our staff, and we'd be happy to answer questions and get people involved and uh, continue reaching girls all across the community. 
Any questions <laughs> I can answer? Yes, please. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the date for the next 5K. What, May when was 18th. it? May 18th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, on your website, does it have the dates of the actual practice? Mm -hmm. Right. Each site has different days and times. So, when you go to the website, you see how that varies. So, are we ever able to warm up with the girls? Oh, absolutely. And all we ask is that if the commissioners are interested in going to the, a practice, just let us know. We connect you Great. with coaches. They would love to have you there. But they have to do the cheer, right? The cheers. Yes, the tell us about what you've seen. <laughs> yeah. Be careful of that. <laughs> well, I, I did do the medals one year as well. And I have to tell you, that was very moving and everything. But I found myself wanting to be a runner with them. It was really hard not to get out there. Yeah, it's hard not to get out there with them. So right. each girl walks or runs at her own pace with a, an adult running buddy. So if that is your inclination, then and then you can come join them from the start to the finish and get to know one or more of the girls in that special way. Who's my adult running buddy? You can be, yeah. Aren't I just a girl? Yeah. Commissioner Devine. Um, I just wanted, I noticed on the card that you passed around uh, to all of us uh, that Molly uh, sign. And Molly is in LA, right? Molly is the founder. So there's two different Mollies. Oh, okay. So this is oh, our or, Molly, your if you Molly. Will. Okay. Yes, Molly Snow is the executive director of Girls on the Run of Los Angeles County. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Devine was part of bringing Molly Barker, the founder of Girls on the Run movement across North America, who's from Charlotte, North Carolina. Ah. Two different Mollies, both powerful, wonderful women. Okay, okay. Now I have a couple uh, questions for, sure. for you, if I may. Um, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but you said you had 74 girls enrolled in the program. Do you by any chance in your mind have a breakdown of the number of girls at the schools, at each school? Like how many did we have at Edison? Or so Edison, I did know this, um, I think it was 23 at Edison. It was a full team. We had a full coaching team so that we were able to have a very rich and um, full group of girls. And I'm happy to bring the specific numbers for that, too, terrific. if you'd like. No, that's fine. Yeah. That, that's good. I, I just Edison has been a strong site. The girls really love participating. I'm so glad that program. we suggested that in South Carolina. Yes, that was I agree. Brilliant, wasn't it? Okay. <laughs> now, I do, you are going to come back to us at a future month to go over some of these this statistics, yes. right? That's in the plan. So happy to bring more details back. Yes. And in your curriculum, because yes. I know you have a, a, a certain curriculum, we were just talking to Anna about human trafficking and the dangers that young girls uh, can, uh, you know, can experience. Is there part of your curriculum that deals with uh, not exactly human trafficking? I'm sure you wouldn't come right out with, with that sort of, but part of your curriculum that deals with that topic of yeah, absolutely. And so the, there's two different curriculums that are age appropriate. So third to sixth graders address um, similar topics as the um, third to fifth graders as sixth to eighth graders, but in ways that are appropriate for their ages. What we find to be most powerful for the girls, whether they're dealing with challenges of um, predators of any kind, um, uh, temptations of just taking risky behaviors, whether it's drug or alcohol use, is that if we help the girls realize that they can make their own decisions about their bodies and about what they do and their behaviors, then that applies in any of those situations. So we really focus on decision making, the power of themselves and being able to stand up for themselves and then being able to practice that through different um, games that they're playing that could apply in those situations. So not, not directly in third to fifth graders, certainly talking about trafficking in that direct way, but in age appropriate ways, building their skills to be able to navigate. Thank you. Elizabeth, I know it's a wonderful program and, you. and you do a great job at all of our schools. Thank appreciate you. appreciate all of your support. Any other questions? Thank you. See you and we look month. forward to seeing you next month. Next month. Thank you for the invitation. I'm sorry. Ms. Alexanian, can we, um, can we just confirm on one piece regarding the Camp Rosie curriculum that the link to Girls on the Run is in that curriculum? Oh, terrific. That we have throughout the summer. That's just a... Right, thank you. Was there a question? Yes, there was a question. Thank yeah. you. Um, do the runs or the practices only happen on school grounds or around the school, or is it sometimes during the weekends you go to the beach or you go to a park? or? 
So the practices are scheduled in the after school hours and the sites that we have in Glendale are school based, okay. though there are others in, across the county that might be in an after school program or at a park. Um, and the practices that we schedule so far are during the weeks, though they could be on the weekends. It is not as much a field trip based kind of activity, except for the 5K. I see. We'll Thank all go you. to the same one across the county. <laughs> Where you. is May 18th? I believe it's going to be at Griffith Park, a new location for us. So we're working on that. Oh, that's a tough location. Yes, <laughs> another good <laughs> I, I location. <laughs> You'll like it. <laughs> good challenge. Thanks again for Thank coming. Thank you so much. Thank you all. All right. And thank you. Okay, we're going to go back to. Um, the agenda, and we are now on 5B. Uh, Ms. Hildago, if you could, or excuse me, Ms. Alexanian, if you could provide us with the next, or Ms. Hildago, the next item on the agenda, and then. Sure. Uh, the item is 5B, consideration and discussion of the 10th annual Jewels of Glendale Luncheon. At one motion, providing direction regarding adding the word volunteer to the nomination eligibility criteria for the Jewel of Glendale Award. And at two is a motion providing direction regarding the 2014 Jewels of Glendale Awards luncheon budget. Thank you, Ms. Adalco. Can we have a brief report? Thanks, Ms. Adalco. Um, since last month, uh, as Commission is aware, we did approve the, the date and the location and the venue for, for the luncheon. And um, last month's discussion was regarding the, uh, the different awards that will be given out as part of the, the Jewels Luncheon. And Commission discussed the Jewel of Glendale, the Gem of Glendale, and the Gemstone of Glendale. The Gem of Glendale being for a student um, in Glendale and the Gemstone being a veteran. Um, the Jewel of Glendale is awarded to women who work, live, or study in Glendale who have overcome obstacles or serve as role models in the community and demonstrate exceptional strength, courage, and um, perseverance. Uh, Chair Miller has, has brought forth and um, has requested that we that commission consider adding the word volunteer. So we have women who live, work, or study, and including, now we would include um, and volunteer in Glendale. And this would basically add a, um, women who volunteer in Glendale as part of the eligibility criteria for consideration of the Jewel of Glendale Award. So that's the first um, motion that staff is seeking commission direction on. And um, the second is the budget. Um, just to kind of circle back from the discussion we had last month with commission, uh, we discussed the different sponsorship levels. Um, Chair Miller, would you like to first discuss the volunteer and then proceed with the second motion, however you prefer, or I can give a full report and come back to the I different. think if we could stop here since sure. this is something new and have a discussion and then move on, it might keep us timely. Sure. So are there any comments regarding adding the word volunteer <coughs> to the nomination form? I think it's a great idea. I, I only have one, um, one question. Do we... You know, if we say volunteer, somebody could be nominated for volunteering for an hour a week. You know, are we going to put some sort of uh, uh, restrictions or specifications or, you know, if, I just think putting volunteer out there is kind of opening the door for a lot of different uh, problems. So. Uh. That's an interesting thought. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that. I'll tell you the opposite position of, of that um, point of view or what's happened in, in and year after year and why this has come up. First off, the people who make the decisions for the nominating are commissioners. So I think that the commissioners are going to look very clearly on one hour versus ten hours. But either way, we can put a stipulation for the time. That That's not the relevant piece. Why this keeps coming up is because we have women who devote an exceptional amount of time of volunteering in this community who are women of courage, and yet for the fact that volunteer is not in there, for example, one, one woman who lives in Burbank and um, works right on the border of Bur Burbank and Glendale, but every community organization she's involved in or that she volunteers at is in Glendale and yet she can't be a woman of courage because she doesn't fit the criteria for it. So that's the, where the, uh, the whole piece of this came up. And year after year, um, people nominate women like this, and year after year, we simply have to, by criteria, um, not include them. The same thing goes for, for women who um, 
volunteer in the North Foothills. We had a similar example to that last year as well. Have we had this year after year that women? Two years in a row that I'm aware of. And I was told that it came up a year prior to me being on this um, committee. So we did tell the, when we, um, when we went back to the women that nominated this woman last year, we did say to them, you know, our options for 2014 and going forward are to have the commission discuss looking at the word volunteer. And so today's, that's where we are today. Isn't our, it too late to, to uh, well, we can't make this change this year because the applications are already out, right? The applications are year. out. We could send out a, um, a revised press release if commission so wishes. It's up to commission. Confusing. And we're doing this for one woman, say? No, there have been more than one woman. There has been more than one woman. It's because of the repeat year after year. I thought when we discussed it and the timing of having to get this, it, for example, if that particular nomination were to be submitted, we don't know what's going to be submitted. If that particular, but it gets submitted every single year, we may at least be able to consider it, and we're far away from looking at those nominations. I mean, the deadline's not over. So to me, I would think if we make a motion this evening, it's, it's going forward from here on out, unless that's written into the motion. So I have a question. Yes. If somebody is applying and have all these like role models or done a lot of things, but it's not, it didn't do any volunteer job, we are not going to consider we receive an application and have all these conditions except volunteers. We are not going no, to. No, that's not the example. The nomination reads live, work. Yes. Yes. If she has all this, except she didn't do any volunteer job, but she has a woman of courage and she works in Glendale and she done a lot. but. She would be considered because of the criteria she does meet, but I can tell you if, if there is no volunteer work, she's likely to be not considered when we get to the final round. We get some pretty exceptional, exceptional. nominations, okay. and we tend to get and this um, nomination that have come in for these two women year after year are fairly exceptional, but we are eliminated from considering them. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say it, it says or, not and, so they wouldn't have to do all of it. They just have to meet one of the criteria to be considered okay. and, and the people doing the evaluation of the the uh, applications would consider everything the way I read it was just um, opening it up a, a little more possibility that um, you know so we have a, a broader pool to draw from I think it's good to have Well, many times when you think about women in courage, let's say a woman does not live or work here, but receives services in Glendale, services that go to her background, whether she was a battered woman or, or a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, but she receives services from us and then comes back into our community and wants to volunteer. And yet, she's a true description of a woman of courage, and yet we can't look at her because... She only volunteers here. That, that's where it's limited us year after year. So if there, is there any further discussion, questions, or can we make a motion? <clears throat> Commissioner Weissman, could you make a motion? Uh, yes. I move um, to provide direction that the word volunteer be added to the possible uh, eligibility uh, criteria for nominations for the Jewel of Glendale Award. I second. We have a second. That was Commissioner Kajayan. And if we could take a roll call, please. Certainly. Vice Chair Burns? Yes. Commissioners Devine? Yes. Kajayan? Yes. Wiseman? Yes. Chair Miller? Yes. Ms. Hidalgo, if we could go to the next item. Or you're, Sorry, the second we're half. To, the we're going to have you read the second half of the report. Thanks. Yes. Um, the second half of the report, I just want to circle back at the last meeting. We talked about the, the various sponsorship levels and um, adding a sponsor level for the 
uh, GEM and GEMstone uh, sponsors, and I just wanted to mention that the report identifies the different sponsor levels and, and working with Vice Chair Burns um, and Chair Miller. The two new sponsor levels that we added are the GEM Student Scholarship Award, uh, um, I'm sorry, spon uh, Sponsorship, so GEM Student Scholarship Sponsorship and the GEMstone Veteran Scholarship Sponsorship, each at $1,000. Um, and they would get uh, two tickets to attend the luncheon. Um, so this is just to confirm the, um, the finalization of the sponsor levels, and of course it includes the, sa the same sponsor levels as last year for the diamond at $5,000, the sapphire at $2,500, the emerald at $1,000, and the ruby at $500. Um, and as I mentioned, the report identifies the the, the number of seats and the um, advertisement benefit that they would receive. So um, the second half of the report, which is basically a motion for the uh, event budget, uh, the bu it's, it's an exhibit to the report. And this year we're looking at a $13,894 budget, which is very similar to last year's, except um, I added $1,000 for the Gemstone Veteran um, Award that we will be giving this year. And uh, to go alongside with that on the revenue side, I added a sponsor for $1,000. So we're looking at about um, $6,900 for the food, which would be the, the cost of um, Oakmont. And uh, of course we pay for parking for the guests at $750. Uh, the awards that we give out, the plaques, um, $1,000 in miscellaneous expenses if we need to do um, swag bags or anything of that sort that might not um, be an in-kind donation if we can't get a sponsor for it. Uh, the flowers and decorations, which in the past I believe those have been in-kind, but we also have a budget should we not, if, if uh, commission is not able to secure a sponsor for that. Publicity, which would be the uh, advertising in the newspapers, the um, GEM and, and GEMstone um, scholarship awards. The, the, the GEM student award is identified and the scholarship award is supposed, should have been the GEMstone. So that scholarship um, award is the GEMstone. Sorry, um, I have a couple of confused. Uh, do I need to clarify any we have of that? Question. question. Commissioner could join. On page three in the chart, when it says a scholarship sponsorship opportunities, Jim student one thousand, and it says not applicable. You mean in the advertising? If somebody is donating one thousand dollar for Jim Stone Veteran Scholarship, we are not going to mention their name. Uh, that would that, be in the advertising booklet. Correct. So in, in this situation, yes, they would not be mentioned in the advertisement book. That's, they would just be eligible for the two tickets um, to the luncheon. Well, they can purchase an app. Uh, they could purchase it, correct, but it wouldn't be provided in kind. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Devine. Um, it seems to me that if someone donates, sees this sponsorship for GEM scholarship or GEMstone veteran scholarship, if a, a business wants to, say, donate $1,000, then I think that they should be the same as the Emerald sponsorship. Now, if nobody comes up for that, then fine. You know, the commission will pay for the $1,000 scholarship or we'll pull it in or however we plan on doing it. But I, I really think I agree, with, I guess, with uh, Commissioner Kajayan that um, uh, if let, let, I don't know, let's just say Massage Envy, for example, says, I'd like to give $1,000 for the GEM Student Scholarship. Are you going to say to Massage Envy, pay you, if you want an ad in the, you know, it, it just seems like they should get, and in their ad they can even say congratulations to the GEM Student Award winner, scholarship winner. So I, I just, uh, I guess I agree with Commissioner Kajayan. This one. <laughs> I got a, a, a similar question with the thousand dollars. How come the scholarship donators only get two seats and the thousand dollar sponsorship get four seats? It seemed like that should be kind of equal too. I, you know. 
Could, do you want to I, I, do, well, I was just curious of the, the rationale. Motion, just so we're clear, the motion on the table is actually about the budget. So we can we can discuss all of these comments. Vice Chair, if you want to um, provide any feedback, you can. Not right now. Are we looking at the budget right now? I think that's what we need to deal with. Just to clarify, if Commissioner wants to, to discuss that, they could choose to agendize it for a future meeting. The, the, if I just may add, the actual item on the agenda is a lot broader than that. So if you wanted to consider something different than um, as it relates to this specific agenda item, you can certainly do that at this time as well. And I, and well, I and it sounds like the it sounds like you the do commission have to wants to do that. Well. It sounds like they want to do that. So <laughs> say, state that back to me again. If you're looking uh, on this, the item on the agenda is consideration and discussion of the 10th annual Jules of Glendale luncheon. So um, this scene, this is covered in the report. It's something that you're um, considering. So if you wanted to provide further direction as to how to amend the um, sponsorship opportunities that's outlined in the report, you could cer certainly consider that at this meeting if you choose to. But if it warrants further study and you'd like the committee to continue to review it and come up with other <coughs> alternatives, we can certainly bring that back as well. I don't, my feedback on this, just in terms of moving us along, and I'm, I'm taking into consideration all your comments, but in terms of moving us towards action, um, my under there was a motion last month that um, tasked vice chair, the chair of the event and or the chair with coming up with this criteria. So if we were to amend anything, wouldn't there have to be a motion to rescind something from last month? Um, I, I will review the minutes as we're discussing the budget. Okay. And, um, comment on the proper process we should follow in the event that you do want to um, make an amendment to that structure. Well, it sounds like we have three commissioners that want to discuss it, so it sounds like that they want to. So if you could advise us, we'll go on to the budget, and if you could circle back and advise us, that'd be, that would be great. Okay, so in identifying the um, 2014 proposed budget, Mrs. Alexanian, did you have anything else to add, or are we looking for a motion? Chair Miller, we're looking for a motion approving the budget. Yes. Okay, when... I was reading the expenses. Do we have a budget? If I'm going to help Vice Chair Burn asking for favors from New York, for example, for some type of, uh, I mean, cosmetic product. They are asking, this is every year we do, it's for shipping and handling, they are asking $150. Before they were donating. Now they are asking because about the economy, for shipping and handling $150. Do we have a budget to pay for? We have a miscellaneous, yes. that would come out of our yes. miscellaneous section okay. in the budget. Because I like to send, uh, because I ask Commissioner, I mean Vice Chair Byrne, if we have any letter that we can send to this company, she said yes. So before I send it, I want to be sure if we have a budget. And given just some of the changeover yes. in staff, I, certainly we can go through these details um, administratively, but just to, yes. last year we had a similar group that donated, and I did write that letter, so I'm sure that staff has it. If they don't, I, I have it. So you're, you're good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, aside from being good, you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Are there other comments? Okay. So we need a motion to approve, um, or are you? Well, you can certainly, um, Chair Miller, you could certainly entertain a motion for the budget first, mm -hmm. and then consider the issue of the um, sponsorship levels next. Okay. So we. Um, Just one thing, please, mm -hmm. Chair Miller. Going down to revenue. Yes. Yeah. I was going to say. We need to change either. Um, Half page. Yeah. Yes, the half page the half ad. Page. It should be three. three. So five hundred. Yeah. So you need to change that. Yes. I, that would be the only thing that I had seen, and then we would have the seven hundred and fifty dollar income. Correct. I need that. Thank you, um, Vice Chair Burns, for <clears throat> pointing that out. That should have been a three. 
So the half page ad is 250, the business card ad is 100. Is that specifically what it is? I'm sorry? It looks like we have two. It looks like a full page is 500, a half page is 250, and a business card is 100. Right. Uh, it's just that the numbers don't add up. Two times 250, it should be They're, they're um, expecting 500, to get three, so. three half pages, not... And this is just an estimate, right? Right. These right. are just so estimates. If we're wildly successful and get six half pages, we'll have more money. Right. So your total is correct, but the amounts listed right. are not. Right. Right. Well, that would be good. So Thank you. Internal consistency. Yeah. I mean, if you have to be accounting incorrectly, wouldn't you rather have it go the way you did it than, right? Came to the correct amount. Okay. So we need a motion to accept the budget as presented. I'll, I'll move to accept the budget as presented with the typo correction. All right. And, and we have a second with Commissioner Kajoyan. And if we could take a roll call, please. Vice Chair Burns. Yes. Commissioners Devine. Yes. Kojayan? Yes. Wiseman? Yes. Chair Miller? Yes. Okay. So, Ms. Uh, Varpechian, if you could please guide us through. Sure thing. Madam Chair, the um, motion from last month um, stated that um, the scholarship sponsorship level for 2014 Jules of Glendale Awards luncheon was approved and the details of which are to be worked out by the chair of the commission and the chair of the event. Um, and that motion was adopted unanimously. There is no um, revision or rescission of that particular motion. That um, the, the, Those two individuals actually came up with the proposal. I think what you're looking for now is um, a revision to what is being proposed. And the commission can certainly do that at this time um, unless there's a further direction that needs to be uh, given to those two individuals. Um, but it's, it's an action that the commission can take at, at, at this point. Great. Tonight. So that being said, if we could go back to the discussion. We've heard from three commissioners. Vice Chair Burns, do you want to add? I think, I think I'd like you to add your, your thought process on this. If we're going to take a look at the amounts and the amounts of seats, I know that probably I'm not allowed to do this, but I'd like to look at the rest of them. I have to re renegotiate some of the above sponsorship levels and um, uh, you know we vice chair do that right well we could but if we I think what I hear the commissioners asking and I'm as the chair of the event I'm asking you to go first I'm well prepared to weigh in on the thought process but I'm asking if you could just inform this commission of the thought process that we discussed that would probably be at least give them some information that they're asking for. I, I think what we discussed was the fact that um, the scholarship sponsorship opportunities are quite different as far as where the money specifically is going to go than the sponsorship opportunities. And the donors for the scholarship awards usually are not looking for a tremendous amount of, um, they're not looking for a tremendous amount of, of attaboys. They uh, are just interested in, in giving the, uh, the money for the scholarship either to the student or to the veteran. And that's really all it boiled down to. So that the thought process, I'm going to, Commissioner Devine, we'll circle back to you. I'm going to add on to that just to give it, um, so that the thought process becomes those people who donate to a scholarship are not necessarily the same types of people who are looking for a sponsorship. For example, going back to the example you gave, which is Massage Envy, which is one of the people I asked, when they give money to a scholarship, they are giving money to a scholarship. That doesn't stop us from a commission in terms of offering them advertisement, but it's not part of the same package that we would offer a sponsor. I think if we start to wrap our arms around them being a sponsor of our luncheon or a scholarship 
donating to the scholarship, it will help us to think of them in terms of different terms and what we might offer them. We can, we can give them a page, but that doesn't necessarily have to go in the offering that you're putting out to a package of an Emerald sponsor. They, they truly are wanting to, people who want to give for a veteran's award want to give to that veteran. That full amount. At least from the people that we asked. <laughs> Commissioner Devine. Um, the premise of my suggestion was that if a business, if a private individual gives this um, donation, they probably would not care, you're right, about an ad. Or an ad, something that someone told me one time about ads and tickets and all that stuff is that it's only paper. It's only paper. And if you give $1,000 and you want, you, we're just donating the paper. Just we'll put something in there that says Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so are happy to uh, donate this scholarship if they want to. Businesses would probably, I mean, I think it's good PR. You know, it's really good PR for us to say, okay, if you donate this $1,000, we'll give you a, uh, what is it, a, a half page in the program, if you want it, if you want it. And I dare say that I don't think anybody, any business would turn that down and say, oh, no, I just want to give this for a scholarship. So I think that... Um, well, any business that's so moved to be an Emerald sponsor, let's go back to the sponsorship, can also, there's a place for them to also donate above and beyond to but, the scholarship fund. But they may fund. want to, uh, Chair Miller, they may want to give to the student scholarship or the veteran scholarship. We may find uh, a few businesses or a few organizations that want to, to give specifically to the Gemstone Veteran Scholarship. So um, I'm just saying that we, I, I think we should be prepared to, uh, to give these, these um, donors and sponsors um, uh, equal um, advertisement and equal, I look at it as a way of thanking them for, for giving their donation. It's only paper. Put their name in the program. But I think you can do that through the Emerald. I think that they can go above and beyond if they're so moved. I think when, if we really look at the situation, I mean, you know, if we, I'll tell you this much, if we want to make a motion for this year, just in the interest of the time, with the view to review this, for all these points that I'm arguing, because I'm telling you as time goes on, these are all based and rooted in raising funds for scholarship versus what happens with people in sponsorship. And we have to remember, maybe it doesn't matter this year, but five years from now when I'm probably not even on this commission, I'm thinking in terms of the people who, who have to continue to raise money. And when we offer similar and exact things, we now give people an option of an emerald versus a scholarship when the people who want to give to that scholarship will give to that scholarship. The people who want to be Emerald sponsors but also want to give to that scholarship will give more money because they're so moved. It's a cause. It's a passion. And so, so what we'll do is <clears throat> if someone calls and says, I would like to give a donation the thousand dollars for the veteran scholarship and I'll you know take the ad and you say no uh, sorry but that doesn't come with do the emerald sponsorship is that the way it's going to go well we can't you, Commissioner Devine we can't do that in a sense because then we're not but giving that's, money I think to that's kind of what you just said that we well, just say well you can give to the emerald and then you get the whole ball of wax no, you can say, would you like to give 1100 so that $100 could go to, would you like to give 1250 You can, you know, they can, there's a section, there's going to be a section on the response card that says you can donate above. Oh, huh. That got lost in translation. It was always my understanding that there would be a section where they could donate above. Sure. My understanding, Chair Miller, um, members of the commission, my understanding was that we were going to do round sponsorships, so it was a thousand dollars, and that's what was approved last month by the commission. It was a thousand dollar sponsorship for the gem and gemstone, so we weren't going to. 
provide a box or anything where they could check off that a portion of this or um, X amount is going to be for the scholarship sponsorship. So it was to be a $1,000 sponsorship, whether we called it scholarship or gemstone or veteran or um, what other name um, the committee came up with, it was supposed to be a round $1,000 scholarship. S Commissioner Weissman? Uh, yes, it was my understanding in prior years when, when the commission did um, award scholarship uh, uh, that all the donations just came in at sponsorship levels and some of that money was used for scholarship and now we're, we're, we're specifying when they want to do it for a scholarship. My, my feeling is that we shouldn't penalize people because they want to give a scholarship by giving them less in, in return for their donation. A thousand dollar donation, this is just a mechanism so we have clearly identified for legal reasons that the donor knew it was going to a scholarship. We're still, for the luncheon, I think a thousand dollars should get them half a page in the program. If they're an individual sponsoring a scholarship, uh, they can either decline it or just say thank you to the women of Glendale or good luck the sponsor, and, and they should get the same number of tickets for the $1,000. The, the, my understanding of the whole rationale of, of splitting sponsorships was in order to identify that it was going for a scholarship, not that it's some sort of a lesser donation and gets, gets less participation. So I, I, would, I would definitely uh, want to change this so that the $1,000 uh, gets four tickets and a half page company logo or other, you know, have it the same. Are you making a motion? Uh, well, I think we're still in discussion. The motion has to be to amend, but Commissioner Devine. Yeah, that, that just, thank you, uh, Commissioner Wiseman, because you just, something lit in my mind right here. Um, in the past, the spon th these were not sponsorships. We just gave them. So they maybe we should not even list them on the sponsorships and not even give two seats or two tickets. It's just exactly. we are paying. The commission is paying for these. We are giving the money from our budget. Well, that, that's what it, I'm, I'm just saying that that's what it's always been. Yes, we never may, asked specifically for a sponsorship for, those, for that award. But you may recall from our last meeting that we specifically were required legally to do that if you wanted to continue <coughs> oh, to provide okay. scholarships. Okay, well then, all right. But you actually put a thought in my, the point I was trying to make, which was not that, is actually, um, you know, Commissioner Weissman, I understand what you're saying, and we can certainly call a motion and go to a vote, and we see, I do think as we continue down this path, what we're going to find, I would just ask you to consider the opposite issue, which is what happens when we have 10 people who now are scholarship sponsors and they are, that we no longer have sponsors for our luncheon, so we can't have a luncheon. We run, well, no. you know, no, follow this. I can add up Camp Rosie in three years if we don't continue to fundraise. We're out of money. This is the reality of the situation. We're not getting CDGB funding. So in, when you add up three to four years, again, I don't know why I care because I won't be on the commission, but I do. I do because it's math. And so what I'm saying to you is that when we look at where we're going four years from now, we've now put ourselves in a situation where we may have a bunch of scholarship people and we can't have a lunch because we can't pay for it. No. Um, Just a thought to consider, but we can vote. I just think that um, the first, whoever comes up first and wants to cover the scholarship, we should have such a problem that we have 10 people that want to do this scholarship. That would be a wonderful problem. Um, so I agree. I would, I would like part. to make, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, finish your thought. I'm finished. Oh. Um, just in, uh, with results, uh, with, I, I think I heard you say you get the first two people who donate to scholarships and, and if, you, if you designate the um, space for someone to donate to that, that's the fund that they're donating to, but it means that you um, would create that fund and so that you don't have the problem the following year is not advertised for that. Just because you collect a um, donations for scholarships in one year does not mean you have to award it in that same year. 
So you mean if we go over zealous this year and we get a number of sponsors and we've hit our scholarship, we could choose? Okay. So when we when we go to a motion, um, I think we need some wording though. We we have to amend something. We have to amend uh, the wording on the scholarship levels. This is. I think we're ready to call a motion, right? We know which way this is going. So. So let's call, uh, I need a motion to amend the sponsorship levels for the 2014 Jewels of Glendale Luncheon for Jim and Jim Stone. We need that motion. Okay. Send it to uh, what? To what? I, I can't make the motion, so I'm just leading <laughs> you there to take it from there. The chair's, the chair's asking for a motion if the motion's to be made. So okay, I'll, 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 I'll move that we amend the scholarship sponsorship opportunities uh, for each of the two categories, GEM student and GEMstone veteran, to uh, be four seats and half, uh, half page in the program um, and company logo and promotional media if donor requests. I'll second that. And if we could take a roll call, please. I'm sorry, before you do that, just for the, the sake of um, clarification and maybe simplifying it for staff in, in making that collection, is your, is your motion that the scholarship um, sponsorship opportunities mirror those of the Emerald sponsor? Yes. Okay. Because it's the same amount. And I, uh, just a, a little bit more discussion, I don't have a problem if we, we make it like... Um, only allow one person to choose the gemstone sponsorship and the and the gem sponsorship. So the first person that asks, you know, gets the the uh, the the scholarship sponsorship, and anybody else that wants to contribute. So well, you just be an emerald and and do that. If you're really worried about not having enough other to cover Camp Rosie and other things, we want to to. Uh, I think Ms. Farpetian gave us an option for next year going forward. And if I think, we get more scholarship, think, mm -hmm. you know, of course. My preference would, would be to find two to, you know, if we get a second sponsorship, give a second veterans, you know. I would like to give to, I give. It would but, be great but to give carry to it over to the next year is fine, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a motion. We need a roll call. Vice Chair Burns? I, I want to hear the motion again. Uh, the motion, it was a motion to amend the sponsorship level opportunities for the 2014 Jewels of Glendale Luncheon, um, or actually for the, I'm sorry, let me get the, for the GEM Student Scholarship and the GEMstone Veteran Scholarship to mirror the Emerald Sponsorship Opportunity. Yes. Commissioners Devine? Yes. Kojayan? Yes. Wiseman? Yes. Chair Miller? No. Okay, next item on the agenda, please. Next item is 5C, nomination and appointment of delegate and alternate commission representatives for the National Association of Commissions for Women, NACW, and the Association of California Commissions for Women, ACCW, for the term of January 2014 through December 2014. First is, uh, at one is a motion to appoint a commission delegate for NACW, at two, motion to appoint a commission alternate for NACW. At three, commission, I'm sorry, motion to appoint a commission delegate for ACCW. And four, motion to appoint a commission alternate for ACCW. Okay. Can you, um, Ms. Alexanian, could you tell us who our delegates are first for ACCW currently? Currently, um, well, it, the delegate is uh, Commissioner Vice Chair Burns, and her de her alternate was uh, Commissioner Tashjian, who's no longer on the commission. Okay. And would you like NACW as well? Sure, that'd be great. And NACW, the delegate is Chair Miller, and the alternate is Commissioner Devine. Great. So when we look to the ACCW as a state and the NACW as national, as you know, we're all attending uh, an event that's coming, many of us are, for the ACCW. We are looking for delegates. Do I have volunteers? <laughs> uh, 
let, let me just say I, I would, but my term is up in June, so I wouldn't be able to, to do it. So I have to. We'll bring it back. Off. We'll bring it back to the agenda. You, you're certainly welcome. You're a commissioner now, and if we had to choose a new delegate at that time, we would, or whoever may come on after you may want to assume that role. So if there's anything that interests you, please don't let that keep you from participating. Well, I'm assuming I'll be gone after June, and I think there should be continuity with whoever is the representative, so I'll... I'll Decline. Would you consider being an alternate? Because we do. Um, you know, I will tell you, having been a delegate, there's there's not much work that's involved other than reading the emails that come um, for the state level. It's going on and listening to conference calls and or attending summits that may exist. From the national level, it's emails and. There may be a conference call here or there, but it's really not time intensive. We just need our commission represented. We are, we are considered, Commissioner Devine can speak to this as well because we've gone to the conference. We are considered a very active and engaged commission. We are one that both the state and the national levels look to us. So, so we really want to have good and strong representation. And I'm, and I'm so moved to request that we have new commissioners get involved as well. That's why I'm so um, which one which one interests you, Commissioner Kajoyan? The national or the state? The national is uh, <laughs> but I'm at, let me clear this. I'm attending this <laughs> Friday, no, this Saturday. Is this ACCW? That's the state. The state. Mm -hmm. But I would it would be great if you went to the national. Okay. If you considered okay, so we have a national. We need a state. Do you want to do a delegate for the national as well? The alternate. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry, an alternate. Yes. Um, so we have the um, delegate listed as commissioner could join, and of course we'll have to, to vote on this. And now we need an alternate for the national. Okay, Commissioner Devine, and now we need a delegate for the state. Vice Chair Burns. Right, but could you continue and because I'll and if Vice Chair continues as a delegate, would you consider being the alternate until until um, Till June. Okay. <laughs> if, if, if nobody else wants to. It'll be similar to, to not having to do much at all. Now, this will be the one year where they'll call a conference. <laughs> they'll call a conference a committee, and okay, you can, I promise you, it's not well, time intensive. I'll, I'll do what I can. Okay, so we need to, we need a motion for those. And you can take them collectively. Okay. So um, we have, a, if someone can make a motion for both the national and the state. Would you like me to make the motion for yes. you? Yes. Okay. okay. So um, be great. the motion will be to appoint uh, Commissioner Kojayan as the delegate for NACW and Commissioner Devine as the alternate for NACW and to appoint uh, Commissioner or Vice Chair Burns for the delegate for ACCW and Commissioner Wiseman as the alternate for ACCW. And do I have a second for that motion? Yes. You, you need the motion. She can't make a motion here. She, she can't. Okay. So she read the motion. So now we need I some move. We need the motion. And can we have a second, please? Yes, I second. Okay. And it looks like we are unanimous. So if we could go to the next item on the agenda, please. Next item is 6B, Camp Rosie update relating to 2014-2015 CDBG grant opportunity oral report. Chair Miller, members of the commission, um, the 2014-15 CDBG uh, request for proposal and funding applications were um, released and due back on December 30th. And this is basically the grant application where uh, staff usually would submit an application for the Camp Rosie program. Uh, this year, staff decided uh, not to apply for the grant for Camp Rosie through the CDBG um, 
grant program. Based on previous year's expenditures and the funding that we have received from Dignity Health and Seroptimist, um, staff believes that it should be enough to cover the expenses for the next year and give the opportunity to other nonprofits in the community to apply for the limited funding for the CDBG grant. Um, the other, the other, uh, or one of the things that staff considered is the limitation in, in the grant funding of uh, who can apply to the Camp Rosie program, um, which usually serves um, South Glendale and, and low-income and at-risk youth, and, and there is a specific limitation or a percentage that commission would uh, have to meet, and, and we have in, in previous years, but the amount of funding that we would be uh, not that we would be eligible, but that we would receive um, wasn't, I guess it wouldn't be the most efficient way for staff to spend the time in reporting back out to CDBG once the funding is received for grant reporting. And so staff decided that based on previous year's expenditures, uh, we would have enough funding with Dignity Health giving $10,000 this year to be able to provide uh, or pay for the expenses for Camp Rosie. We sent a letter to Chair Miller and she did ask that we announce it at the commission meeting so staff would like to say that the decision was made at the staff level to not apply for, for this grant this year. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer but um, those were some of the things that staff considered in making the decision as to why we shouldn't apply for the funding this year. Thank you, Ms. Alexanian. Okay. Next item on the agenda, please. Item 6C, Commission on the Status of Women's 2014 Master Calendar of Events. 2014, and if we could. The, um, just to report out, next month, February 2014, the, um, the theme or the topic for the month is non-traditional careers. So if um, any of the commissioners or Chair Miller, if there are any recommendations for a speaker, mm -hmm. be happy to take that. Um, but there isn't anything specific that stands out other than when we have a date for the uh, misrepresentation. We'll identify that for the month of March, but just looking forward for two months. Um, in January, as Chair Miller mentioned, uh, some of you will be attending the ACCW Winter Retreat, which will be at Mount St. Mary's College. and. Um, we have Yellow Ribbon Week from the 20th through the 24th, and Commission approved the sponsorship for the Hands and Words Project for, for that week last month. And we also have on the 23rd a luncheon, which is the um, Community Grants Award luncheon through, for the Seroptimist, and I believe all of you will be attending that luncheon. Didn't we already have that? The, I'm sorry, did I say Seroptimist? I meant Dignity Health. I apologize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I stand corrected. The Dignity Health um, luncheon, which will be at Glendale Memorial Hospital. I'm going to actually say more about that in my comments. Thank you, Ms. Alexandria. Thank you. That was very, very um, helpful. Do we also have for February, do we have somebody from the school board or the GUSD coming to speak mm -hmm. to us about the project? Yes, um, GUSD will be coming before us as one of the agenda items in February for commission to provide um, to provide the commission with a report of how the Hands and Words project went. That's great. That's good. Thank you. Okay, and thank you also, Ms. Hidalgo, for um, I'm just going to make as we relates to our calendar and such. If you, uh, I want to thank you personally in front of all our viewers for updating our website. It looks fantastic, it's current, it's thorough, it's on top of everything, and we appreciate you did that a while ago. And um, every time I go to it, it's pretty exciting how more and more of our events populate it. But um, if, if everyone wants to know, it's http www, uh, semicolon forward slash twice, and then www.ci.glendale.ca.us slash women. All right, next item on the agenda, please. Uh, the next item is seven, Commissioner staff comments. Great. Okay, um, if, we could, um, if we could start over here with our student ex officio, Mirza Khanian. Um, we start the new year with uh, a lot of hope and a lot of uh, empowerment towards women. 
Um, I hope that this year will be a, a very revolutionary year, a very empowering year for women in the area. Um, I have no events to report, but um, I would like to congratulate all my stu fellow students for getting through the finals week and making it through to a wonderful year. Thank you, ladies, for joining me in this new year. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Weiss. Okay, uh, yes, uh, on December 10th, uh, Commissioner Kujain and I attended the Catalina Verdugo uh, Adobe reopening and uh, were recognized. And uh, of course, uh, Catalina Verdugo was the daughter of Jose Maria Verdugo, one of the original Spanish land grant holders of this area, and of course, celebrates women. And uh, on December 10th, um, with Commissioners Burns and Devine, we were at the uh, Women's Civic League lunch, where uh, State Senator Carol Liu and Assemblyman Mike Gatto spoke. And um, the reason I even mention that is that uh, the Women's Civic League of Glendale uh, meets usually at lunchtime. Um, and um, it's a wonderful opportunity. They have different speakers uh, hear about civic involvement and engagement in Glendale. And I really um, encourage all women, uh, particularly you know young women, to, to join and uh, become involved. They, um, like so many volunteer organizations in our city, um, the participants are are getting a little older, and and it would be wonderful to 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 uh, fold in more young people. So so uh, I hope our student ex officio members think about joining and and. Uh, family members and other young people uh, to join up. And the same goes with uh, Prom Plus. On December 14th, I toured Rock Haven again with the, with the uh, CV High School Prom Plus, and it was wonderful to see young women students playing the role of Agnes Richards and, and uh, some of the Rock Haven residents. And again, um, Friends of Rock Haven is an opportunity for young people to get involved in all of these organizations. Um, it, it's it's uh, good to have more language ability. And so particularly multilingual speakers, particularly when um, uh, the Adobe is open on Sundays, I've been a docent for a while and it's very difficult when people, I only speak English and it's hard to try to, to um, show the treasures that the city has when we're limited language ability. So those of you that have different language abilities, consider volunteering then too. And uh, luminarius are at the Adobe too, that was on the 14th. And in the interest of time, I'll skip some of the other things, but, but uh, I do encourage people to get involved. Thank you. Commissioner, could join? December 15, I attended a Glendale City Christmas party and it was a beautiful Christmas party. Almost 700 people were attended. And also on December, no, January 9, <clears throat> I attended ANC Glendale Chapter Annual Armenian Christmas Party. Uh, Commissioner Wiseman and Commissioner Devine was there too, and it was a very successful Christmas party. It was a networking reception, you can say that. I also attended the ARS uh, Christmas Party on January 2nd and it was more than 200 members attended that day. Thank you. Student ex officio, Sahakian. Um, so I would just like to remind our viewing audience to continue nominating and to nominate um, any students or women in our community that they think fit the criteria for the Jewels <laughs> Luncheon Awards that we have. And if anyone would like to volunteer with the Winter Wonderland that we had presented today or with the Girls on the Run um, organization to come in contact with the commission. So thank you. Commissioner Devine. Um, I'd just like to, um, to thank the city for the lovely Christmas party. It was uh, very, very nice. And it was nice to see it come back because we hadn't had it for a few years. And I also want to thank the ANC. Um, for having that Christmas party and we all had to bring toys and they were all donated to the YWCA and they were ecstatic over that so uh, thanks to them and I also want to thank uh, Seropnus International Glendale for their grant for our Camp Rosie program uh, it's a joy to work with all you women and I just want to wish everybody a uh, happy healthy and exciting new year 
Vice Chair Burns. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, the Women's Commission attended Robert Castro's swearing in. He became our new police chief this past month. We congratulate him, and we hope he does a fabulous job for us. Thank you. Well, I just want to wish this entire commission, as well as all of our community organizations that we work with and our fellow community members in Glendale, a very prosperous, healthy, and happy 2014. We're certainly starting off um, full of action and activity and planning. We are very fortunate to have the support of community partners like Seroptimus International, who, um, as you know, we all attended a luncheon, and we're very grateful for their continued support of us with Camp Rosie. As we look forward to this month, we're also very, um, so very grateful as a commission to Dignity Health, Glendale Memorial Hospital, for their significant donation to our Camp Rosie program. Um, significant enough that it is really going to be one of the most um, primary factors that we're able to continue to offer it this particular year. So we're very grateful to Glendale Memorial Hospital for their ongoing and continued support of this commission. <coughs> and with that, this meeting is adjourned at 7.31 p.m.